So I'm going to get started because we have a little bit of stuff to cover, and I want to make sure there's plenty of time for participation and questions. The workbook is not vital to what we're going to talk about right now. So if you haven't got it yet, that's okay. You can get it later. Okay? <coughs> Um, so that's a, so Vivian has just mentioned that we do have some digitizing going on upstairs. Um, I believe my student Erin is upstairs to help people with that. If anybody was expecting to do that at this point, that's going on upstairs. Oh, okay. So Vivian can help you as well if you want to work on scanning your items. Oh, scan. Yes. Where is that upstairs? It's um, kind of directly above us. Oh, okay. now. Yeah. Did you need a call? No. So I do need to see my notes. I'm sorry, this view is not is not ideal. But anyway, let me let me just get started officially. So again, my name is Amy Winter. I work here in digital initiatives where we scan stuff every day. So we have a range of equipment that we use here. Um, that doesn't make me an expert, right? I know what we do here. So I'm gonna share some of that with you, but I also want people to be able to share their experiences as well. So we have a real kind of stew pot, right, going on. So what I'm gonna talk about today is what I think the most crucial aspects of digitizing using scanners are. The workbook goes into a little bit more detail, and there's also a lot of resources in the workbook that you can dig into more for even more detail. So we're kind of got three layers. Um, we're looking at pages three and four in the workbook today, if you have that. If you don't, that's okay. Um, so, who here has used a scanner before? Great. Who uses a scanner every week? Okay, small, smaller group, but we still have a lot of experience right here in the room, and that's great. Um, the first thing I want to talk about, and this might seem a little backwards, but when you go to the scanner to scan your item, right, it's going to have you name your file. And why is that important? Why does that matter? The accessibility later. To say, so say that again. Uh, so you can uh, easily access it later? Excellent. Um, can everybody just remember to speak up because the HVAC is really loud and people in the back, it is hard to hear. So the, the answer was make it easy to access your file later. So you don't duplicate your work. That's a great one. I didn't even think of that. What else? What other reasons for thinking about it before you start? So you can pick it out from everything else. Exactly, exactly. Yep. So Any other people, ideas? So other people can access the documents and know what they're looking at? Right, right. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. Here are some general rules. And some of this was in, in what some of the people said, and there's going to be some other stuff too. So the first thing we, oh, what's wrong? So are we following on the book? Or are you going through the You can channel? follow on the book if you want to, but you don't have to. But you don't have to, okay, because yeah. people were wondering what page in here. It's pages three and four. Okay. Yep. Thank you. <clears throat> sure. Okay, so the first thing is your file names have to be unique. Why does that matter? What does that mean? Well, because you'll copy over other files. Exactly, right? If you have a file and then you use that same name again, you're going to overwrite what you already have. Okay? So we need to think of a name that's going to be unique, and one of the best ways to do that is to use the date. If you work in an archive and you have a formal naming system, that's a great way too, because every item has its own number, right? Or some kind of identifier. But I think a lot of the people in this project aren't necessarily going to have that kind of structure already set up for you, right? Okay. So the next most important thing is that it should be human readable. Why does that matter? Right? And as someone said, so that when you go back in later and you have 75 files, you have a sense of what each one is. Okay? So we want to be consistent. 
right? So it's nice to have kind of a formula for how to create these names before you start. Again, having the date is nice, and then having some keywords maybe. And we'll look at some examples. Um, so what does be persistent mean? Keep trying. It does mean that. It does mean that. And, and that'll be a very important skill as you go through this. In this context, though, what they mean by be persistent is don't refer in your file name to something that's going to change. Okay, so if you work in a library and you're about to change your identifiers, right, <coughs> for your items, don't put the identifier in the file name because it's going to change. And then you'll either have to rename all of them or you'll be constantly referring back to your old structure. Can anybody give me like a better example of referring to something that might change? Uh, so I, I'm an archivist and I have collections that have box and folder numbers. And when we reprocess a collection, if we do, all of those box and folder numbers may change. So if that's in the name of the digital item, I have to change everything. Yes. We have two challenges. One is uh, field identification wrong, and then the file realizes something else and it doesn't get. Okay. Also, you speak up. Between, oh, also the difference between an accession number, the accession number, and the field number, mm -hmm. or the catalog. Number. Okay. Those are really good examples, and again, those are for more formal systems, and that might not apply to people who are working in the community. So you're going to have to adjust this based on what your needs are, but it's definitely something to consider. Yes. Every time you change the leader of your organization, <laughs> they will start the counting from one again, and you'll have 17 number ones. So another excellent deal. <laughs> okay, so this is just, these are just things to be thinking about before you start. Because once you start, then you have to go back and fix things better if you can have a structure beforehand. Okay? You're not doing a plan for what you want to have, you want to do it first. Um, a plan is a great thing to do. I highly recommend it. Totally recommend it. Yeah. So, why do we want the file names to be short? Does anybody know why? That, well, that's great. I didn't even think of that. That's totally true. It's a lot easier if it's shorter. Um, the technical, or one of the technical reasons is that some servers have limits on how long your file name can be. So if you're trying to upload it to, for example, the Manitos Project site, there might be a limit. And if yours is longer, it's going to reject you. Yes? I have a quick question that may sound silly, but if we're going to be putting this on a the server, what if both of them, you know, two different institutions have the same file name? Hopefully that won't happen. <laughs> That's why you're going to work really hard to make yours as unique as you can, right? <clears throat> so why do we not use punctuation or special characters except underscores? Anybody know why? Because that can also be rejected. Right. Servers oftentimes don't like those characters. Um, and that's a problem with diacritics, certainly for Spanish. And we'll probably, that'll probably come up maybe when Margie presents tomorrow. <coughs> so, yes. Um, why do we use underscores instead of spaces? Same, right, servers. And lowercase characters? Thoughts on that? Because generally, lowercase is easier for humans to read. All caps tends to be harder for people to read. So, with that, I want to show you, this is what we get from the scanner in our office. If we just slap something on the flatbed and hit scan, this is the file name that we get. So all the rules immediately broken, right? <laughs> and the files had to be renamed. Uh, fortunately, most scanners in their interface will have a place for you to type in a file name before you can scan, before you scan. Now, yes, it's annoying. It's kind of like texting, right? It's usually the point hunt and peck. But just like we've just talked about, it's totally worth it. So this is one end of the spectrum. This is right, this gives you no information. You don't know what KIC image one, right, who's in it, 
when was it taken, who was the archivist, who was the creator, you know, you don't have any data about your, about your image. The other end of the spectrum <coughs> is more interesting. So these are also problematic in a different way, right? So what's wrong here? Just too long. Too long. What else? There's spaces. I know, I'm sorry, it's really small. The next slide, they'll be bigger. Can anybody else see anything wrong here? It's like there's parentheses. There's lots of punctuation. Yep. yep. And what does that big long number at the beginning mean? Uh, so that's an example of an archive identifier, right? I'm not going to tell you where this came from, but they did have a numbering system, right? So, however, even though this isn't an ideal way to do it, they were trying to do something, right? What were they trying to accomplish? You need to. Exactly, right? They were trying to remember all of the stuff about these photos. So that's a good goal. This just isn't the way to achieve it. What's a better way to do that? Use the notes category. So, right, where does this information really belong? Okay, perhaps I'm going to say that this is really the item description. Right, maybe fleshed out a little more without abbreviations, with less punctuation, right? But this is a description of the item. And we call that metadata. Librarians have words for everything. <laughs> so that's what we're gonna be talking about a lot tomorrow, is metadata. But this is metadata. They just put it in the file name. Okay? So let's see if you can see the next one better. Is that bigger? Can you see that? <clears throat> Yeah, kind of, sort of. So let's talk as a group about how we would name this now that we know how to do it better. <coughs> what would we call this file? Right, it's got to be unique. It's got to be human readable. It's got to, shouldn't have punctuation or special characters, right? All of those rules that we just talked about. Does anybody have some suggestions of what we might call it? Yeah? So you might go with the year that the picture is okay. supposed to be from. You might so go, the year? Right. You might go with, I'm not sure if you go with one or two names. Uh, the, la the last names the of, last the name of the people? Right. right. Um, and then maybe wedding. Right? Maybe exactly. That's exactly what I was thinking. I would name it, because they have an internal numbering system, I would use that number. And that's actually what I did. Right? When I renamed all of these, I kept the number. And then because they needed to know to work with it, I might call it 022G.075. There shouldn't be a dot there. You could replace that with a dash, right? And then an underscore, and then Gutierrez Saez Wedding. And you could throw the 1950 in there if you had two Gutierrez Saez Weddings, one in 1950 and one in 1957. However, however you can make it unique, right? Does that make sense to everybody? Mm -hmm. yeah. Great, yes. So then where do you put the other information? Is that on your numbering system? So ideally what you're doing is you have a spreadsheet yeah. or you have a Word document. In one field is your file name, right? This number, Gutierrez Saez Wedding. And then all of this other stuff, which is the description, or perhaps the title, or both, you're going to have separate fields in your spreadsheet okay. so for your metadata as you're creating it. Is that clear? <laughs> kind of, sort of? Okay. Okay, and this is not the only time that we're going to talk about this. So we'll come back to it. So, next topic. File formats. Again, we're still on the page three and four in the workbook if you have it. So let's talk a little bit about a digital image. What is a digital image? What do I mean when I say that? Is it just a picture? Okay, no. <laughs> <laughs> it 
it can be a picture. Like this, this guy with the hair, that's kind of how I felt earlier today. <laughs> um, but it could be anything, right? The subject of a digital image can be anything that you can take a picture of. It could be a pop. It could be a postcard. Um, it could be, mm, this is probably a gray area, but it could be audio, right, or video, right? It's, that's using image more loosely, but that's still going to be digital material that a lot of this project is going to work with, okay? Questions about that? Is that clear? Okay, so um, does any, anyone who's scanned or who's worked with digital images, what file formats? Do you know about what ones have you heard of? JPEGs. JPEGs. Yes. BNP, right? That's a less common one, absolutely. What else? GIFs, PNGs. Yep. Wave. Wave. Wave is an audio format, right? Definitely. <coughs> Anybody heard of like video formats? MP4. Mm -hmm. There's also there's ABI and a couple others for video. And what about resolution? What information do you have about that? Those of you who scan, what resolution do you like and why? 300. Why do you like 300? Because everybody else wants it at least 300. Do you know why they want that? Because the resolution is good. Okay, so the reason why 300 and DPI is dots per inch, pixels per inch is PPI, and that's in your workbook. The reason why people like 300 DPI or PPI is because that's the minimum resolution that you can get a good print from. <clears throat> so if your, your digital image is going to go back to print, then you need to have at least 300 pixels per inch in your scan. So that will explain, maybe people have had this experience where you get an image off of the web and then you try to print it and it looks like garbage. <laughs> because web resolution is 72 pixels per inch. Okay. I see some like light bulbs, I see some other people like, I don't really know if I get So <laughs> the the takeaway is that you can't scan an, something at a low resolution and expect to use it for an application that ha needs a higher resolution. You can't go up. If you scan at 300, and then you want to display it on the web, which is 72, you're golden. That's fine. Yeah, did somebody have again? How do you know how many PPIs are in your image? So you need to set that on the scanner. But when you get images given to you. So you need image editing software for that. Okay. Yep. Um, there's a great one called Earth and View that's free. Earth and there's a, a link to it in your workbook. And it's free to download. It's, I think it's pretty easy to use. Um, but it's also really powerful. It can do a lot of the things that Photoshop can do, but it's free. So that's pretty easy to use. Mm, to me. Yeah. <laughs> so for changing resolution like that, it'll definitely help you. It'll tell you what your resolution is for sure. So you'll know, can this item be printed? Or can I only display it on the web? Yeah. And and once it's down to 72 and you bring it into your thing, you yeah, so can't much. take it back up to 300. You definitely can't. You can't go from big to from small to big with digital images. You go from big to small. You can't go the other way. I mean, you can. It'll look horrible. Okay. It takes forever. Yes. So I'm going to give you, here's my quick and dirty, all right? This is what I do. I make a TIFF file, which is tagged image file format, which no one needs to know, except me. <laughs> and I scan it at 600. If you scan it, that, that's archival. That's a preservation copy of your item, right? Is this making sense to everybody? Okay, if you, if you do this, if you set the scanner to give you a TIFF file, at 600, you will be able to do whatever you want, ultimately. If you want to sell posters of your images that are, you know, 24 by 36, then you'll probably be able to do it. 
you'll definitely be able to let a researcher print it in their book, which is what we get requests for a lot. Okay? Questions about anything that I've covered so far? Biomaming, resolution, um, file formats. Great. Okay. Yes. I have a question. Yeah. Um, when you have a smaller image like a slide, do you change the target size before you scan? That's so technical. Well you must be an archivist. <laughs> so in the workbook on page four, the government organization that deals with digitizing cultural heritage information recommends 4,000 PPI for slides. That's not what you were asking, right? Well, I don't think all scanners can do that high of a scanning resolution. That is very true. So I changed the target size to be roughly 8 by 10, okay. and then do the scanning at 600 PPI. I um, think that seems like a great solution. Yeah, so that's a great point that Portia brought up. You're going to have equipment limitations. Just because I tell you to scan it at 600, your scanner might not even go that high. So it's, it's an imperfect world. Wonderful. Now we're going to talk about some fun things. Yes? I have a question. Probably not. Go ahead. But if it's, so you're telling us how we should scan. And what, I'm what telling you how I scan. Okay. <laughs> this is how but I do then, it in the program I work. How does it go into Omega? We're going to talk about that tomorrow. I know, but are there some cats? Do you have any time, anything that tells you? You know, when you get to the image, the JPEG or GIF or all that stuff, does it say anywhere in Omega that you can go, this is what it is, it's already in there, or is this way back in the beginning of logging? We're, we're not even at Omega yet, we're scanning. Yeah. We're just okay. going to scan a file onto our computer. Does that, make, does that make sense? Yeah. Can you hold on till tomorrow? I'll try. It'll, it'll <laughs> become clearer tomorrow, I promise. Okay. okay. Okay, bad scans. These are fun. I love this. So, why is quality checking important? What what could go wrong? What could possibly go wrong? Right? Why is quality? Leave off a portion of your original document. Right. It could be hanging over the edge of the scanner, and then you've got the edge cut off. That's a great example. Out of focus. It could be out of focus. I've got some other good examples that I'll show you. Does anybody have like real world horror stories they want to? Oh, oh no, never. No. <laughs> Portia, nothing? Uh, I'm sure I have done many bad scans <laughs> in the past or ones where the color is off. So you do a color photograph um, and the colors are just all wrong. And it right, looks right. Terrible. So color correction is a whole vast area that we're not even going to talk about today because it's just way too technical. Did it, was there another? Yes. Put your card or whatever is in the wrong side of the scan. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So then what, did, what does it come out looking like? <laughs> okay, that's bad. <laughs> all right, so I'm going to show you a couple of examples. And fortunately, these were all done by my students, so I don't have to take credit, <laughs> but that's, I, I probably should take credit because I trained them, so yeah. ultimately it's on me. So what's wrong with this one? I know it's hard to see. I'm sorry. It's very light. That's, that's an excellent point, and unfortunately that's out of our control for a lot of documents because they are just old. And we can tweak it, but sometimes you can't get the scan that you would like to have. Because this this particular document, this is a thesis from before 1940. I would say so it was typed on a typewriter, on vellum. That's why it looks like that. But the problem to me is this. Can you see that it's obscuring text? <coughs> what is it? So that's a piece of dust on the scanner. So how we fix it is 
using the scanner, right? And so usually the scanner that you're using, hopefully you have access to some documentation on how to best clean it. But an easy way is um, they sell wipes that are safe for cleaning electronics. That's a good way if your scanner is okay with getting wet, because they are wet. Some scanners don't want to be wet. So um, Swiffer cloth is good for that, okay? Here's another one. What's wrong with that? It's a little crooked. <laughs> it's crooked. So in, in library world, we have the word skewed, right? That's what we call it, it's skewed. Um, how could we fix that? There's a couple ways. Any ideas? We scan it straight or, or, or flip it in Photoshop and put it back where it belongs. Those are the two ways, right? You can rescan it if you still have the item. You can put it on the scanner straight and scan it again. Or you can edit your image with, for instance, Earth in View, which allows you to resize or, it's not called resize, what's it called? Rotation, right? You can rotate that image and then cut the edges off so it looks clean. Yes? I think the date is cut off as well, probably below the university. Of it is, and this is just, this bar at the bottom is the PDF um, thing that pops up, right? It's not actually part of the scan. So hopefully, hopefully that wasn't a problem, but good call, good catch. Okay, here's my favorite. And this actually was done by me, because those are my fingers. So, right, fingers. But, but they need to be in the archive. Well, they are. <laughs> so the trouble here, and this is a problem that I haven't actually fully solved, is how do you scan bound things, right? This is flat. It lies on the scanner really nicely. If it's a bound book, it's got a binding and it's tight and it wants to do this kind of thing. And so that's what my fingers were there for, to hold it flat. I think what I ultimately did with this was I pretended that this page was a lot smaller and I cropped it like down to the top of my finger in the image editor. And same thing with this side. So then I had two pages, no fingers. But that's not ideal. And you would be surprised that's so easy to miss, right? If you're just kind of looking, oh, the text looks good, go to the next page. There's your fingers. All right. So that's everything that I planned to cover, but I'm happy to take more questions, have more discussion. We've got about 12 minutes. What do you want to know? Question. So, um, TIFF files, are they, did they not work on every computer? Does it take certain software? That's a great question. So, TIFF files are kind of the gold standard for <coughs> digital images. They preserve as much information as possible. The other formats, especially JPEG, tend to remove some of the information, some of the electronic information about the photo or whatever it is. That's why TIFF is better. <clears throat> the downside is that TIFF files are really big because they're preserving all of that information. And some systems, like you're saying, are going to say, I don't want this. And it's going to want you to put it in a different format. That's why that TIFF 600, that's an archival copy, right? You're scanning it at that so that you know that you have a copy of your digital object that, ah, thank you, <laughs> that will always be usable. But once you have that, you can use your image editor to make it a less large file and or change the format. Right? So you can change a TIFF to a JPEG, save it with a different name. Actually, it's going to be .jpg, so it'll be a different name. And then you have two copies, one that has all of your archival data, and one that's more what we call compressed, which means it just took out some of the pixels and saved information about what they were, and then presumably puts them back, recreates them later. That's way too technical. Forget I said that. Um, so that's the difference between TIFF and JPEG, but that's a great point. A lot of times a TIFF is not going to 
go on the web, depending on the system that you're trying to add to. Yes? I can tell you a horror story about a TIFF file. Why don't <laughs> A long time ago, I made a TIFF file of an old picture I found of my grandmother and thought I'd be really nice and send it to my big brother. And he got really mad at me because when it was downloading, it literally took up his computer space that he needed to run his business for like three hours. <laughs> he did download finally. But yeah, it took him a while to not get mad at me anymore. Yes. Maybe too technical, but uh, yeah, when you when you're dealing with uh, files that you scan, like such the ones that you had on, on the prompter, like the uh, yeah. yeah, is it possible? Uh, what what uh, format type is best for uh, is being used be for a tech uh, was it text recognition? So ah, that to okay. allow your 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 text to be searchable later. So that's a whole other area. Yeah. I'll say a little bit about that. Um, this, for example, is borderline for text recognition. Okay, the computer is going to be able to figure out some of this. It's going to see this stuff and be like, what? Um, it's gonna, it might see this as a letter, and this is just like dust or something, right? <clears throat> it hates handwriting. So if you have a handwritten document, forget about text recognition. Just really, just forget it. I mean, you can try. You'll be frustrated. Um, it doesn't really, the format doesn't really matter. Um, there are two programs, well, there's tons, but probably the most popular, well known one is Acrobat. Adobe Acrobat does text recognition. There's another program called Abby Fine Reader, which is really expensive, but it's awesome. It's the best text recognition I've ever seen. Really good. What's it called? Abby Fine Reader. It's it's soup. It's like thousands of dollars. So it would need to be like an institution that would purchase it, probably, unless you have a lot of money. <laughs> um, did I did I kind of answer? Yeah. And again, that's a whole, that's like color correction. We could spend the whole day on that and not talk about everything. So yes. Um, my question piggybacks a little bit in terms of when you're scanning long texts and multi-page texts. Mm -hmm. um, how do you approach that? in terms of, like, do you have, you know, a TIFF for every page, or? Um... So, yes, we are very fortunate here at the library. We have a dedicated book scanner that's automated. So we don't have to, like, flip the book, scan, turn the page, put it down, scan. We, it, it turns the pages. So I'm very lucky. So I know that I'm not going to be feeling your pain here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, but yes, what that, the scanner has software that goes with it that makes a TIFF, not only it makes a TIFF of every page, and that's what this is from. It also makes a thumbnail of the TIFF for every page. And then when we're all done, it combines those TIFFs into a nice PDF for us that we can upload to the internet. And is that accessible to us? <laughs> sorry, so no. how do mere mortals uh, <laughs> sorry. tackle some of this? <laughs> yes. Um, but if you have Acrobat Pro, you can use that to combine multiple individual files into one PDF file. Exactly. That's, what, that's what the software uses. It just, it's built on top of Acrobat Pro. So would you recommend preserving both the individualized tips? And the I recommend that for everything. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, if it turns out you don't need it later, you can always delete it. But if you don't have it, and then you don't have the object anymore, you are limited to what okay. you do. Okay. Thanks. Go ahead. Why do some people ask for PNG? Um, so PNG is called Portable Network Graphics. Nobody needs to know that except me. That's <laughs> my, part of my nerdiness coming out. Um, PNGs are, I think that's a Microsoft format. And the nice thing about PNG is that it does transparency, which is nice for, um, like, if you have a nice picture of your grandson, but it's against an ugly background, and you want to take the background out and put it against a nice white background with just the child or something like that, PNG is nice for that. But other than that, it's just another format like JPEG, where it has its own rules about compression and how it handles things. But it's not it's not an archival format. It's a good web format. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Oh, again, again with the ding-long work 
stuff. <laughs> so digital preservation, yes. Um, you're not gonna, if you're doing a lot of stuff, you're not gonna be able to save it all on your computer. So you need another way, or your phone, right? It's gonna fill up. So USB drives are nice. They are pretty small, and you can also, they're not that expensive anymore, and you can get them with like a lot of capability, right? A lot of storage space on a, just a little thing that you can put in your pocket. So those are nice for backups. Um, I'm gonna date myself, but you know, CDs, <laughs> right? All of these formats have advantages and disadvantages in terms of how long they're gonna last and what can go wrong with them. Um, there's also portable hard drives. Those are kind of more expensive than the USBs, but maybe they last longer. They're less likely to get lost because they're bigger. So, you know, pros and cons to everything. But yes? How many places should you have backed up? I would have at least two. At least two, not in the same flow. Again, I work in the library, right? So we do things, we're like extra careful more so than than some people, or then maybe a, a community-based user needs to be, but maybe not. It just it depends on on your goals, right? So yeah, at least two backups, and preferably not in the same house, in case your house works. Another question? Yeah? Um, do you have a way of equipment you use to digitize like a delicate old family album that has delicate binding? So, my friend Portia, <laughs> you're a to answer that question for me. Um, it, it's hard. I would recommend an overhead scanner instead of a flatbed scanner because I think if you have to like turn something over and then manipulate the pages facing down, it's going to do more harm to them than if you are able to digitize it while it's up. And then if it's that delicate, I would try to cradle the pages uh, while you're scanning them so you don't have to force the binding all the way open. Great so. answer. Yeah. Unfortunately, I don't have one of those, but I would like one. We do have public ones upstairs yeah. okay. that uh, you can use. So, and then you can either, I would save it to a flash drive. Um, you can email it. I think saving it to the flash drive is a lot easier. Great. Yes. I was working on this project scanning large blueprints, so it was a big file size. Mm -hmm. And we had wanted to be able to put them in a spreadsheet as, you know, both PDFs and JPEGs. Mm -hmm. But there wasn't a very fast, efficient way to like drop a file of the prints for a certain camp and just have them make a copy as a JPEG or whatever. Uh, do you know of anything like that? that is able to do it can you, really fast? Can you explain more what you're uh, So to... we scanned these blueprints that had never been done before. Okay. Like, um, and so you we have wanted, them scanned as a JPEG? Yeah, they okay. were scanned as a JPEG. And okay. we wanted to set up a database so people could be able to search and find the blueprint for a specific building that they wanted. Okay and have a couple options just in case they wanted to email a smaller file or something mm -hmm. to somebody okay. as well. Um, so I made, besides just the like Excel spreadsheet or whatever, mm -hmm. I made folders for each of the camps and I put the main building blueprints in those ones so that you had a visual, uh -huh. you could just kind of scroll through if you wanted. Cool. Um, and those were still all JPEGs. Uh -huh. I didn't have a really fast way to say, hey, I want this folder as, you know, another format as well. So you're that. saying you wanted to like take your JPEGs and make them into PDFs, but you wanted to do it all at one time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so there's, so I think EarthInView has a batch process. It does. Um, okay. I don't know if it will output to PDF though, but it will definitely batch process a whole bunch of images. If you wanted to change your tips to JPEGs really fast, it'll do a whole folder at one time. Okay, because I did see yeah. options just to do it individually, but we had. I know that takes <laughs> it takes a long time to do it that way. Yeah, 
Yeah, okay. so you want some kind of software that can batch process. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, so it's time for me to turn it over to Jane. Thank you very much. I'll see you again tomorrow. Project has a uh, research assistant and documentarian, and we also have this commitment to practical and affordable technology um, that is uh, uh, workable in all kinds of situations in rural communities. And Shane has been doing a ton of research on uh, what kind of things can be done just by an individual, what kind of things can be done, um, at, you know, at the local level at uh, some kind of centralized level, and then, you know, super high end. So we have tiers of sort of equipment and hardware and software issues. Um, but I think what he's gonna talk about mainly is the kind of DIY approach that uh, we favor. So, was that right? Yeah. Was that true? Yeah. <laughs> How does everybody feel? Do they want to stand up for a couple of minutes or do you want to just keep going? Okay, anyway, I get started making the chat. Um, uh, so, like Amy said, I am Shane Flores, I'm a research assistant for the Benitos Community Memory Project. And what that's meant a lot is uh, instead of doing like really uh, Intense, like archival research stuff, it's really meant figuring out how to do weird stuff that needed to get figured out. And a lot of that was, as Mimi mentioned, uh, we really wanted to, rather than base things on a lot of times what happens when people say, hey, we want to get a bunch of equipment and send it out there and people will do stuff, is people don't often really do stuff. The learning curve is too high for specialized media equipment, often people get intimidated by it. So rather than do that, start with what people use every day. And uh, you know, that's really at this point everybody's smartphone. Everybody has one mostly. A lot of people are already using them to do archival stuff. Um, but the question, the trick was, and I'm really glad Amy went a lot into uh, some of her geekery about files and file sizes, because really some of it was a lot of like, if you are going to try to do field work with a smartphone, is it going to be something that is going to be archival quality? Um, and do that thing, which he said, like preservation copies. Once you have those, you can always go down, but you can never go back up. So we want everything in the archive to be something that is up. And so well, I'll get to that later. Um, before we get to all that, I do have a mini presentation um, on projects that were created by the uh, Menitos Project Summer interns from Highlands University. And the reason I kind of wanted to leave with all that is that um, as much as you're going to be hearing from me about archival quality and all that, I thought it might be good to see some examples of why that's important and what it means to activate the archive. Because, you know, this is a, a larger thing in the <coughs> archival world, which is it's great to create an archive. But then, how do you get people to use and enjoy that Arctivite and how to activate it? And we did uh, an experiment, I guess you could say, with that during the summer with uh, some of our summer interns. So, um, uh, let's see, what's going on? Oh, yeah. So, uh, oh. I'm sorry, I got myself lost already. Um, why isn't it? Oh, there we go. Okay, I see what's going on. Okay, so um, we had uh, several projects going on, and each of these projects made, I'm going to read this mostly, by the way, because if I don't, I'll go down weird tangents and we'll never get out of here. So I'll be reading mostly. Uh, so Is there a reason that you're not on that screen also? We don't know why we're not on all the screens. Okay. It's some weird, This it's this thing. Okay. <laughs> but I don't know how to use. So. We will stare at it a lot. Yeah. yeah. So, so sorry it's only on that one. I was liking that there was going to be three, but that's okay. Uh, um, so each of these projects that we did do during the summer made good use of uh, the kind of the material that we envision collecting in the community archive. 
photos, objects, documents, um, and transforming that material into something fresh and engaging, sort of out of the archives and into the world. Um, as the entry point into media production of different kinds becomes easier and more and more community members that don't think of themselves as media producers create videos, books, and websites on their computers, uh, the likelihood that the assets in the community archive become activated becomes a bigger opportunity. Uh, it's partly the kind of the role of how archives are shifting, right? There's more people that are going to want to get into archives and use the stuff that's in there and want to be able to have our archive be useful in that way. Um, this first project by Becca Sharp is a 3D virtual reality portrait of the Real Sala. Uh, the Real Sala was a building in Cuesta. It was a little bit grocery store, a little bit bar, dance hall, movie theater. It did a lot of things. Essentially, it was the unofficial heart of the community from sometime in the 20s till it burned down for the last time sometime in the 50s. Um, obviously, this is a picture of the Sala, and that is Becca's Sala that she created in in Unity. Um, she create, specializes in creating spaces in Unity, virtual spaces, um, and she creates objects in a program called Blender, which is a 3D creation suite. And what she was really intrigued by, she had actually several buildings she was looking at and we were talking about, and all the ones she had selected were buildings that no longer existed, which we thought was a really interesting and it was really important to her. Uh, she did a lot of research and explored the concept of the decolonial imaginary to figure out her narrative strategy uh, for this, and it really helped inform what we think is a very interesting virtual space. Um, I will see if I can figure out, this is a video, but it's not showing up as a video. Um, well, I was hoping to play this for you, but it's not going to. I don't know why it's not showing me this as a video. I was going to show you her, her, her a, a movie of what her space is, but basically it is a virtual space where you get to enter into the building. Um, I really want to show this to you. I don't know why it's not there. Um, and um, you, I'm sorry? Was there a question? I just said persistence. Oh. Um, <laughs> Uh, and you know, you enter the building, and there's uh, different objects in there. Um, and when you and some of the objects were like this pot, she recreated this very pot here um, into a thing. She used this picture to, to sort of. This actually isn't the real solid. There's weirdly no internal pictures, so she had to go do a lot of research and do comparative things. This is another supermarket in Quest that someone took a picture of. And so she did a lot of recreating of spaces and objects from archival material like this in there. And when you go in there, if you stare at an object for 10 seconds, it will take you out into like an information screen that talks about that object that's important in the thing and sort of recreates the space as a repository for memory. But she didn't want it to be anybody's specific memory. And, okay, so. Uh, Go ahead, you go first. Quick question. Yeah. Where, where can you find this online so that we can? Go? It's not online yet. But I'll I'll, uh, so the plan is for it to be an app. Getting it into the app store takes a little while, and their summer internships are very short. But Becca obviously is very interested in learning how to do that. So we're trying to figure out a way to get have her get her app up on the app store. And what it's going to be is going to be it's designed for use. There will be like a. a a um, online version, like a website version, but it's designed for Google Cardboard, which is a very affordable entry into uh, um, being able to use your phone for experiencing virtual or augmented reality. I think New York Times gave away these, and Google actually has, you can download and print out a Google Viewer Cardboard's plans and build one yourself, and you slide your phone into it, it has lenses and you can experience that. So she wants to make the app and she designed it specifically as a Google Cardboard experience. So we're trying to keep these things at a very affordable level for people to experience. So both of those things, and hopefully that answers your question. Well, if you want to, we'll figure out how to let you all know when it's available. And you had a question as well. I don't want to go down too much of a rabbit hole, yeah. but just, um, if you could just quickly describe the difference between uh, Unity and Blender. Blender I know, but I don't know Unity. Okay, uh, so Unity is more of a design suite for building virtual spaces. Becca builds a lot of buildings. She has worked on other projects she worked on. In fact, her and I worked together on the, list, the new uh, 
uh, Manhattan Project Park or whatever they're calling it up on Los Alamos, and she designed spaces that couldn't be seen in that space. So she's very much into designing spaces that can't be experienced in the reality for some reason. So that's kind of more of a, a design suite for virtual spaces. Blender tends to be more for if you want to work on objects and things like that, as best as I understand it talking to work, because I'm not an expert either. But that's what I understand this to be the difference. She, yeah. Yes. Can you describe what the slide is doing? Um, like is, because when I see yeah. this, I'm familiar with this photo, okay. and I just happen to know that there's a young woman right in that place that's being covered. And so for me, like when you layer like this also online, just being aware of the integrity of the original photo, because for me, there's like an erasure of women's labor there. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, it totally makes sense, and yeah. it's just a slide for this presentation, okay. so that I could show some objects. This isn't going okay. anywhere, yeah. And I just had to make some decisions. Okay. That's what I was asking. Why how to do it? Yeah, I, I didn't mean to erase her labor or anything. I, 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 I honestly wasn't thinking that much about the, yeah, yeah. the design since it's a slide for today, and I didn't, I didn't put as much thought into it as maybe I should. So, um, so yeah. So I, I just wanted to show examples of the material that, that was being used. Um, Okay, any other questions or comments at the moment? Okay, um, so uh, compl complicating Becca's task was that there's virtually no first-hand recollections uh, of the building. Uh, she used archival photos. She was able to uh, replicate the exter exterior because there were photos of that. Um, and then she used oral histories that provided her the, with the description of the interior um, and kind of use that to design what I, I explained earlier. Hold on, I have to grab tea. Uh, so um, the other two projects were done by Natasha Vasquez, who's an artist and designer from, well, I'm not sure if she was born there, but she identifies as being from a village near Taos because that's where her grandparents live, and it kind of is what informs her her experience of this project as a Manitos project. Um, and the first of her projects is a set of posters uh, celebrating what are now being called, uh, because of what happened at a workshop that Esteban is at, Manitos personas, which are kind of ar archetypal figures. Uh, from Manito's culture. Um, and uh, these the archetypes we use emerged out of a brainstorming session between the interns, Esteban, and myself. And they are the Mayordoma, the Curandera, the Abuelas, and the Maestra. Um, and what uh, Esteban asked Natasha to do was look at a project called Paper Monuments, which is a public history project in New Orleans. But over the course of the internship, we need uh, Natasha really kind of made those personas her own, um, you know, connecting up more with an aesthetic that is really her own aesthetic that she uh, takes from her preferences, which are watching anime and reading manga. And uh, let's see, where did my notes go? Um, and I think that that's something that was really interesting that she did because. A lot of times when working with traditional material like this, people tend to want to mimic traditional forms or do a callback to them and have them resemble. Their, it's a very backwards looking procedure. And Natasha instead went, I want to draw these things the way that I really enjoy making art. And so she's really being very forward looking in some ways with the aesthetic and melding the traditional, I think, with the much more contemporary artistic form. Uh, and um, so she also did things like kind of, she liked ideas of gently subverting uh, tradition, like for example, um, the Mayordoma, you know, we talked a lot about how some of the roles are shifting and traditionally the Mayordoma role, or Mayordomo role is a very traditionally masculine and patriarchal role, but that's not really the case anymore. And a lot of times uh, the people that are taking care of Ezequias are women who are fulfilling this role, and she really liked that idea and sort of wanted to 
to change that around. So there's a, a tension in her work between the tradition and sort of what's happening in the present and in the future. Um, so, um, but, and, and, but there's a, she has a lot of sensitivity to tradition, like the grandparents, this is based on a picture her mother provided her of her own grandparents, and so she likes to do that as well. Her other project uh, is one that she got really excited about. She was almost more excited about this in the posters, and it's a digital comic that's in the uh, tradition of the Menudo's Trova. Trova, which is uh, Thomas Atencio describes as a debate in verse. Um, the Trova that Natasha used for her comic is called El Trova de Café y Adobe, uh, and several archival versions were provided to Natasha. The one she chose uh, was an interesting version that gives the edge to Atole in the debate, um, which she really likes. Uh, and once again, her aesthetic drives her interpretation. She chose to kind of go with this interesting, super flat approach. Um, and she really wanted to anthropomorphize the figures and have their debate happen in like a human reality that doesn't know that this conversation is going on, you know, while the uh, Abuelo and her maestro grandson are having a, their own conversation. Um, so, uh, the, and part of the reason why I think it was good to talk about this was all of these projects would have been difficult to realize without access to high quality archival materials, those, you know, preservation level uh, copies and examples of, of uh, materials. Um, so, uh, I think that was a good jumping off point to talk about, you know, what I mostly came here to talk about, which is how to uh, start to create that archive to digital archival quality standards, uh, as much as possible. Like this is, I, I want to make sure to make that clear, this is a as much as possible thing, right? It's more just getting us all really used to the idea that if we can aim for those standards, no matter how we're collecting whatever material we're collecting, that that's a really good idea without having to, I, I'd hate for anybody to go, oh, well, I'm not going to do it because I can't get to those standards. It's just trying to do it. And my personal belief, based on my research now, and I'm hoping to evangelize to all of you, which is that it's really actually not that hard to do, even with your DIY resources and even in the field. It's really just a matter of knowing how to do it and that it's no harder than not doing it. So, so that's kind of the thing. Um, so, uh, let's see. So, when we speak of a digital archive, what are we talking about exactly? And Amy talked a little about, about this. It's basically, a, a, the digital archive is a digital record of things. It's not the actual things, it's their digital versions. Or if it's something that's digital in origin, then it is its reality. But the point is being that it's not it's not a, a like an archive in a traditional way where you have manuscripts and paper things. It's all it's all digital stuff. Um, and many of these things um, do exist as physical artifacts, like photos, documents, um, you know, all kinds of stuff, tapes, things like that. Um, and uh, the ones that are digital in origin um, are often already digitized versions of things that are analog, like tapes. This is a perfect example, Jack Lefler's audio collection. It exists at uh, the um, uh, Cesar Chuckle, not Cesar Chuckle, sorry, uh, Fry and Jellico, uh archive as 902 reel-to-reel -reel tapes. Some of them have been digitized, often they don't even know which ones have been digitized. Uh, but this is the kind of material that um, Mimi referred to earlier, which is in the in institutional archives, we'd like to see it figure out how it's at least in dialogue with our archives so that people can find these things. Um, but I'm getting distracted, so I won't go down that particular rabbit hole. Um, and all of these artifacts, whether they have physical world analog or not, are subject to the whims of fate, capable of getting damaged, lost, or simply degrading over time. Um, and what the digital archive does at its best is preserve all of these resources in a digital format in what one might describe as a charm or a ward against time. Um, as a result, the digital archive becomes an important access point to these digital researches for the purposes of what museum folk like to call interpretation. 
which is the creation of meaning from these resources. So there's that difference uh, between preservation and interpretation as a, a really crucial thing to do. And part of what's really important about doing things to archival quality is that they are exactly that. They are there to be the gold standard, as Amy called it, that can then be altered for interpretation. But we want to have a really good baseline. What's in the archive has to be the thing that's the most truthful thing to what the thing is. And interpretation can be as ambitious as a museum exhibit, but it's something as subtle as changing the color values in a photo or cropping that photo. And it's good to be aware of that when one's trying to create those gold standard preservation copies of things. You want the true thing. You don't want the altered version to be there taking the place. I mean, yes, it's an additive process. You can add all the changed versions you want, but you want that original main one to be as accurate as possible. Um, and this workshop's based on the idea that um, in order to, to interpret things, you know, you, that you have that thing. Um, this is kind of a slide that talks a little bit about how, you know, the thought process of what you really want to see um, when you're starting to create those versions. And I think that it is a, a goal that's easily done even with your cell phone. Um, so the Manitas project would not likely not exist if there was not people already on the ground documenting family histories, collecting historical materials, photos, documents, artifacts, and sharing and comparing information. Now what comes right down to it, what matters to everyone really is the content, or as much as I talked about the other stuff. Um, in the case of the photo, for example, what matters most is, are the people recognizable? Who are they? When was the photo taken? And what are the stories of the photo in votes? Um, the same goes for an oral history. What's being said? Who's saying it? Or maybe who's singing it? Um, on the Facebook community groups that are in some ways the origins of this project, photos of photos generate a great deal of enthusiasm. Some photos can generate hundreds of comments, adding information, opening networks of associative data. Uh, but field documentation is tricky, uh, and conditions are always imperfect. Um, I'll stop briefly just to say, uh, and this is again one of the huge main caveats of all this is this whole my presentation is focused on field work because we know that in reality there's often times where you know your great aunt isn't ever going to let her shoebox full of photos out of her house you're going to have to go to her house to get those if you want them in the archive but ideally if you can take stuff to a place where one of Amy's scanners is that's what you want to do if you can get anything to a high quality flatbed scanner, that's going to be the best thing. But field work is a necessary and crucial thing when you can't get to that massive flatbed scanner. What's the DPI of your scanner? It's like 48,000 or something? Yeah. Uh, no, I think no? Not, not thousands. Okay, hundreds. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know. These imperfect conditions often result in things where photos are distorted, the color is off, uh, there's a shadow across the surface, part of the photo is missing. Um, and we really want to try to mini minimize these imperfections. Um, for example, here's a, this is actually in an archive, this is in the Rare Books Room in Las Vegas, but when this uh, very well-meaning person took this photo and put it into this photo album, they glued everything in, and so now even these are photos, which I think I found out later weren't actually originals, thankfully, all now have shit, you know, damage from the glue used and things like that. So these are these are always conditions that stay. Uh, in addition, Facebook, which is, you know, our example and a lot of, you know, what Amy talked about earlier, this in some ways, the idea of migrating things off of Facebook is going to be very difficult because Facebook's image compression is incredibly brutal. Basically, any image you're going to get off Facebook, like Amy mentioned, is totally useless for anything else because, um, I mean, well, you can just see the size differences between original images and what they end up with Facebook. I mean, from 1.1 megabytes to 350 kilobytes, that's just a horrible, horrible thing to do to any image. So we want to avoid this, and we want to avoid putting things like this into the archive whenever we can. A lot of times we'll just be lucky to have that incredibly tiny digitized image from Facebook, but if you can do it better, why not? Um, 
So as an example, like here's a Facebook downloaded image. And here's immediately what starts to happen to it if you try to scale it up. You can see the digitization here, all this weird stuff that happens around the edges of, uh, of pictures. Um, so uh, intradigital archive standards. Um, these are standards from uh, NARA, which is a national, I always forget this. I can't remember, it's like remembering the seven dwarves. National Archives, does anybody know? I forgot what NARA stands for. National Archives and Records Administration. Thank you, all right. I don't know why I can't remember that. I should write it down in my notes, but I don't have it here. Um, and, you know, these have been uh, developed by the archivist community to ensure that digital versions of things are that big, that can be made small, and and they've gone, the, I mean, that. They have the manpower and the resources to develop these things to an amazingly detailed, geeky and nerdy like uh, degree. Um, and it's really great. I include a link, I think, here somewhere. Well, I'll probably get to it later. If you really want to go down that rabbit hole, you can. But the idea is that some of their general ideas are things like, for example, with still photos, right, TIFFs. Preservation masters, they want tips for them. I think it says somewhere in there, right? So, and they, they have all those standards to do this. That's an ideal, but it's a good thing to strive for at a minimum just try to get an idea of what these things um, are. Um, one example I have of why this is important is that in Las Vegas, back in the 80s or something, there was an amazing initiative to digitize a bunch of photos, their collected photos. Uh, and you know, brought in them in and digitized them, but because of the limitations of technology at the time, a lot of those aren't really that usable at this point. Um, I think a lot of them were scanned at 72 DPI for some reason. Um, they'll need to be scanned again if they're available because it was a limitation at the time and we want to future-proof this archive, this digital community archive as much as possible. Um, so here's the, the link to all those standards if you really want to go into them at some point. Oh wait, no, that's not it. Um, well, yeah, okay, there's Nara. I, I could have just done my next slide, sorry. Uh, but there's the, the, so I will make this presentation available to whoever wants it to get things like that, information of where to go for this uh, uh, archive standards. So um, for our purpose today, we'll, we'll concentrate on some reasonable our achievable goals that are based on these standards. Um, and uh, so a lot of them are the same ones that Amy has, the creation of high quality digital files that reflect an accurate re reproduction of primary material with little to no digital compression, no Facebookizing of things. Um, so this is a good time, you know, Mimi at some point mentioned in her introduction that we had developed these levels uh, for our project of, of digital practice, um, and you know, a lot of what I might cover in the show and tell really covers those first three, but we have a plan for all the way up to our level five. So level one is uh, the digital community documentarian. This is everyone that's already doing stuff, they have their own equipment, and perhaps all they need is information about improving technique and information about technology that can help them. Level two is uh, providing some a la carte uh, equipment that might assist a lot of which I will show and tell later that we hope to get into community nodes uh, where people can check out things if they say they want a shot box, which I'll show you later, which really helps take st still photos in the field. Uh, level three is a kit that includes a lot of that stuff for people who want to do this kind of work but don't have anything to do it with. Again, checked out from a library or, or community center. Uh, level four is equipment, like really high quality scanners that will be put in libraries or community centers that people can take material to if they're able to. Um, and level five is something that's probably uh, more a phase two thing, but we'd like to see a regional, regional digitization node for dead media. So uh, mini discs, VHS tapes, uh, Betamax, uh, if you have family movies or anything on those, we'd like a place where you can have that stuff done in a little bit closer to home. You don't have to put it in that scary box from Kodak and have it digitized with 
a thousand other things at the same time and probably get lost on its way back to you. Uh, so, uh, when we started thinking about what goes in there and how to collect it, the, question quickly, the questions quickly became, uh, was it possible to build a workflow that starts with the technology that people already use, as I mentioned, smooth out the learning curve and achieve a sustainable practice that can be transmitted person to person with the community. It's really important to my mind and a lot of why I want to evangelize about what can possibly be done because I think it's not going to work if, you know, if for whatever reason when our project ends if people stop doing this in a way that really contributes to the archive. So in some ways I'd like to see the knowledge of how to do these media practices become community knowledge as much as something like cleaning the acequia is, right? It's, it's becomes part of the community heritage to know how to preserve the stuff correctly, which is um, the idea. So, um, at this point, if you'd like to get your smartphones out, um, if you have them, I'd like to go over a little bit on how to really, there's not a lot you can do with your phones the way that they are, but we might as well start to talk about it so you at least are familiar with where in your phone you might know where to start to change the settings in them so that you can start to take archival quality images. Um, our, the thing about our phones too which is interesting is that they are, they have the capability of making archival quality images but they're not designed to do that. The, the people who make phones want you to fit as many photos on there, they don't want you to have the quality and they assume you're putting everything on the web. So their goal is to get web quality photos, not archival quality photos, but the cameras can do it. It's just the artificial intelligence doesn't want you to do it. So, um, and that goes for audio and video too. So uh, what we'll cover a little bit now is, you know, these three basic areas of field collection, photo, audio, and video. Um, and we can always talk about it later. So uh, the first thing I'd like to ask is who has, uh, uh, iPhones. Who has Apple phones? Okay, that's good. Who has any Android-based phones? Okay, so it's half and half. So, uh, I'm sorry. I said I think it's an Android. It's an Android? It's, if it's not an iPhone, then it's probably an Android. I have no idea. In field identification. Yeah. I have no idea. Okay. Okay. It's smarter than I am. I already know. That. Okay, there they are. They're smarter than all of us. They're going to take over soon. Um, so, one caveat that I have to say is, and my examples are, because I'm an iPhone person too, but also part of it is is that iPhones, because they are a single totalitarian operating system, actually has is easier to work with in this way because all the answers are the same across the board. Uh, Android devices, there's actually many different protocols that go into that, so it's a little bit harder to talk about um, Androids simply because they don't always do the same things all the time. So um, I'll try to address Android stuff as much as possible, but unfortunately my examples by necessity are iPhone examples. Um, so, but in some ways this is not as bad as it sounds because, uh, you know, there's a thing anyway where apps and technology change so rapidly that the answers that I might give you today or help you with today might change in the next update that you get. Apps are changing all the time and you know the ones that can't do things now like for unfortunately right now uh, Androids for whatever reason uh, can't create lossless TIFFs which I'll get into in a minute but someday they will. Someday someone will write an app and it'll work and that'll be great. Um, so I don't want to really focus on the specific apps that I am going to show you. I more want to ask you to recognize what you're looking for when you're either going to choose an app or look at your settings. So um, these are the icons. If you don't know where your uh, photo settings are or your settings, these are going to be the things, the ones that tell you that one's Apple and that one's Android. Is everyone in their settings? Okay, um, so um, again, here's Apple settings when it comes to photography. Um, and, and I'm going to kind of go quickly through this because there isn't a lot you can do here, which is kind of the point. So if you're looking at your Mac, you, these are your settings. Uh, you want to go into your uh, camera settings there, and you're going to see this. Um, um, so let's see, what do I want to talk about here? Okay, 
So these are the kind of places that I want to see. Recording video, here's where you want to see that. And where's the camera one? We'll be in formats where you want to go there. The first one we'll talk about is video. I want to talk about video mostly because I want to point this out. You're probably going to default. So with video, the thing that you really want to do when you're taking video is really go for the highest quality that's going to be a really common and easy thing that most people are going to want to use your video for. So right now at this point it's 1080p HD at 30 frames per second. 30 frames per second is the video standard. So if you're editing, if you're wanting to use your video to actually edit video, which I know sounds like a weird thing, that's the just normal regular video, that's the one you want it to do. Uh, your phone might do something weird sometimes when it thinks you don't have enough memory, which is drop it down to 24 frames, 25 frames a second, which is a, will be a lower quality, but it thinks it's saving you space, and it's kind of okay that it, oh, so I guess it's 24 frames a second, because um, it's supposed to be a more cinematic look, but 30 is going to make it easier. But the thing I really want you to look at here is this part, because your phones have whatever memory you have on your phone, and if you're going to be using your phone to go out and do, say, a video shoot, you want to take as much stuff off your phone as possible so you have a bunch of space, but this will help you plan your shoot because this tells you how much time, how much space takes, or how much time takes up how much space. So if you can make a decision, you can go, I'm going on a two hour shoot, well, okay, good, I've got plenty of space because I only need, you know, and then you do the math, 90 times six or whatever. Um, so this is a good and important thing to know about. Um, when it comes to cameras, and this is true both for, actually Android has a little bit more leeway in this case, but with Apple, the general idea for a lot of these is that they don't even tell you anymore what you're getting, right? I mean, they do here, but they don't give you choices to choose anymore on Mac. If you want JPEGs for your photos, how big you want them, they just want to call it high efficiency, which creates this HEIC file which is something only Mac systems recognize, or most compatible, which creates a JPEG. And part of the reason why I want to talk about this is because this is the main crux of the problem with the phones, but there is a solution for it. Because they want to fit as many photos on your phone as possible, everything defaults to creating JPEGs. And this is pretty much everybody's phone, whichever thing is. They want to create JPEGs, which is, you know, as Amy talked a little bit, a lossy format. This is not good for archival quality at all, but that's what the phones want to do. And what's weird is that your phone is actually can and wants to take a larger, bigger photo, but it automatically compresses it down to JPEG so that you can fit more pictures on your phone. And because they're assuming, like I said, that they, you're only going to want to ever put it on the web. So I wanted to show you that, but none of it's really that important. But, that's what you can do for the most part. Um, audio, there's almost no settings that are native to smartphone devices for the most part. Um, this is why we're going to talk about apps in a second. iPhones do have this thing called voice memo, which actually records lossless M4As and mono, which mono is actually really good at what you're doing is doing oral histories. If you're doing simple voice recordings, you actually want to record in mono. You don't want to record in stereo. So it's not terrible, but it's not great either because you you can't, you don't have a lot of control over this, and you don't have um, control over getting out, out of your phone either, which is a really important thing. Um, so, um, and this relates to something that Amy was talking about. This actually shows, and, and for whoever asked the question of, of where you find out what your size image is, um, if you have your phone, if you have your images in your computer, you can actually go to get info on your images and it will tell you information about your pictures. But what I mostly wanted to show you of is these are the same information so for two versions of the exact same photo. This is a TIFF, this is a JPEG, and you can see the massive difference in size. This is how much more information you get when using lots of TIFFs. Um, Where do you go to get that? Um, if, if you were to have your images on the computer, oh. um, it, you can actually click directly on the file of your image, whatever it is, and at least on Macs, oh, I actually know PECs, but there's somewhere you can go that says get info, and get info will bring up this information for the most part. On yes. Androids, when you're in yes. your uh, settings and you're on the picture, the actual picture, 
the three little dots on the right hand corner, you just click on that little three little dots and then press details and it'll give you all the information. Thank you. Please weigh in if I don't have any Android information that is important. Uh, so, um, how do you get those archival quality images? Well, that's the thing. For this for, and for audio, you really have to resort to third-party apps. This is the solution for turning your smartphone into a device that can get, um, and I just have this image to show how many there are. There's hundreds, hundreds of phone uh, third-party apps for cameras, um, and what they're really designed for is how you think and how you take photos. They all do essentially the same thing, but their interface is really gonna be the thing that tells you what you want to do or how you want to do it. Find one that you like, but, uh, you know, so that's, that's really what you want to look for is, does it take pictures like you want to do it? And really in some ways more importantly is, how do you get the photos out of your camera? And by that what I mean is at the, at the level that you took it off. You don't want an app that's going to take a beautiful photo for you, but trick you and sort of turn it back into a JPEG when you try to get it out of the device. So that's a really important thing that you want to look for. How do you get your photos out? It's a very transparent that you know that when you took a TIFF, that you get a TIFF when you take it out. And you know having that much control over your formatting settings. Uh, so again, as Amy mentioned, this is the really golden thing that you want in your phone to be able to do, and an app that can do this. Lossless tips. That is the, the, the killer feature that you really want in an app. And unfortunately, right now, Macs have this option. Androids do not. That's uh, hopefully going to change soon. Um, uh, but uh, what you can look for with Android is uh, apps that have uh, the ability to create raw photos. Raw photos are actually incredibly high quality as well. The problem or the thing that I don't like about raw photos is that they force you basically into this role of being an interpreter because what you get with raw photos, photographers love raw photos because it means you get what your camera saw on the sensor without any settings at all and you have to re-add your settings for color, saturation, uh, uh, exposure, uh, contrast, all back in. But that's not really good for our purposes because we kind of want to know what we are getting when we took the photo to, again, reflect accurately what the original object was without having to interpret what it was. Um, so uh, uh, here I'll get into some of the recommendations I have, which unfortunately for Android people, I'm sorry, are Mac recommendations. I do have a website to go to that there's a link for Android in a second. But um, so with with Max, I recommend highly ProCam 6. It is a app that lossless tips, it takes lossless tips and it's really easy to get them well out of out of your phone in the sense of that you can uh, send them to your photos and then airdrop them out. Um, it gets very affordable at six dollars. Uh, there's a bunch it's so successful that there's a bunch of uh, copycats now, so make sure that it's the one designed by Samer Azam, because uh, there's a bunch that are named ProCam 6 with like a space between Pro and things like that. This is the one you want. Um, this is its interface, it's very clear, you can choose tip up there in the thing, you can even choose based on its limitation if you're using one or another or both your phone cameras. Um, it has all the settings you might want, basically it turns your phone into your DSLR. You have DSLR level control over your phone. And this is what you're taking your photo out of, or is this after you take your photo? No, you, you want to take your photo app. in the app. You want, but you want to bypass your photo app on the phone, and you want to open ProCam and take your photo in the app. And then it's going to store it in the app, and you need to move it to Photos or just airdrop it directly out on, on to your computer, which is one of the nice things with Mac at the moment is that it, you can wirelessly send it immediately to your computer when you get to your computer. Um, Android, you still have to, as far as I know, yeah, I so could be wrong. I was just going to yeah. say that some Androids have yeah. that as part of the operating system. So oh, great. Like that is fantastic. Has, has that. Okay. Are you I able have, to get I don't know how to use it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, so this will be good news that I haven't been able to find in my research. 
Are you able to do lossless tips? I'm able to do raw. The, okay. No, the lossless tips. No, I don't. Oh, you can do raw. Though. I can do raw. Yeah, which is like which is almost as good. I have the settings yeah. at the bottom, and that's just part of yeah. what it is. I think that's pretty. It's not unusual. Yeah, great. Yeah. Good. Good. You got a question as well? No, I was just gonna say I I have Android as well, but it, um, I have a Pixel phone as far as size. Um, it actually takes it at the highest possible yeah. resolution. Um, I don't use this for for archiving stuff. I'm an archivist, but uh, as far as the space. With this particular phone, um, you get uh, unlimited storage because it, it gives you unlimited uh, virtual storage. Because you just send it somewhere it just immediately? Yeah, it, it keeps yeah. on your phone, but if your phone starts getting short on space, yeah. it just sends it to a cloud, to your cloud. You have a cloud that's unlimited for photos. That is great. So one thing that I would say is make sure this leads to what you really want to see is I would definitely double check to make sure that what it's sending is whatever, as close to uncompressed as possible and not squeezing it to send yeah. it. So, yeah, I haven't checked yeah so I would say find that out yeah. for sure. Yes. Um, I, I just took a picture of your kitty cat oh, okay, great. and I actually emailed it to myself uh -huh. and it didn't lose any of its bigness. Fantastic. That is what we want. Yes. That, so if you but think, I but I always yeah. use my camera whenever I go do stuff, yeah. so I don't know so if I'll use it. But however, nice ha, however you can get it out, as long as you know you're not losing any quality, uh, that's good. Okay. Yes. Actually, I was just um, playing around. So I'm an, archiv I'm an archivist during the day, so on my off time, I'm, I normally am not paying attention to it. I'm just doing fun stuff yeah. with with my phone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I actually do have a setting here that is RAW plus JPEG control. Okay. So RAW plus JPEGs are kind of nice when you're wanting to play because you get your JPEG version, which is yeah. mess around. RAW is going to be that one where you have to go in and do the additive things. Um, you probably can get pretty close to what you had, but um, you're going to be making decisions. You're going to be making, you know, interpretive decisions, which I think is, you know, I mean, for the most part, a lot of stuff, it's, you know, it's just, it's a, it's an extra added factor, I guess you could say. And hopefully you guys get lots of this TIFF stuff soon. Because um, then it is, you know, what you saw and what you actually wanted to represent. So when you're looking to your camera and when that's right, that's what you get is right. So uh, I'm glad that there's like that much variability in that. I was kind of bummed and sad that I had to come in. Yeah, a lot say. more control than I expected. Yeah. And that's what uh, this really thing is get really familiar with what you can do. But I, these are the things I want you to look for because it is. It's going to change all the time, and it, you know, like, it's, if you can identify, okay, this is the thing that I'm needing to know about this. It's what I'm looking for. Yeah. So um, this is the. Oh wait, no, I didn't change it. This is the video setting for uh, <coughs> ProCam Six. It also is a pretty good video thing. You have a lot of control over your aspect ratio. I don't know what that stuff is. Golden ratio. I don't know. Ignore that part. Uh, but so this is a pretty good and versatile app. Um, what is that? Where do I have that? Um, I don't know what that is. Oh, this is actually the video. The video screen when you're actually shooting video. Um, so this is the website, which again I can make this available to you. Uh, that I found that's best for really breaking down right now what you can do with raw photos and Android. It has a bunch of really good recommendations. So get you that website if you're interested for Android people. I'm sorry I don't have better answers for you right now, but this is as good as it gets. These people do a really good job of displaying. Um, so getting things out of your camera. Um, right now, like I said, one of the best things about iPhones right now is that you can do AirDrop, and so. You'll need to figure out on your computer the settings that make AirDrop show up uh, here on your phone. I mean, it's pretty easy. There's like an AirDrop in your top level menu. You'll find it. But this is what you'll see when you want to go get photos out of your phone. And you can do batches. You click on this little circle and get a check like that. And you can do a bunch of photos. I've done lots of photos. You can do videos, although I wouldn't do too many videos at once because then it gets sometimes freaks out. But this is where you want to go. Um, for video, I actually really recommend this app, Filmic Pro. It's a little bit expensive for an app, but again, we're talking not hundreds of dollars expensive. It's a $15 app, 20 if you bundle it with its remote, which is more interesting than it sounds like, because with the remote, you can actually use another device to monitor what your camera's doing, so 
you don't want to be hunched over your camera or prefer to be, you know, create a, a more convivial setting. You can put your camera off to the side and say you're doing an interview and not look. You can monitor it on, like, say, your iPad in front of you and not look like you're staring at everybody through a camera, which is kind of nice. But Filma Pro is very adaptable. And it's also one of the apps that I know for sure will take uh, audio in live from a secondary microphone because you really don't want to have to use your phone's microphone for doing video, so you can get much higher quality audio using Filmic Pro. Um, here's its, what it, its interface looks like, it's very intuitive. Here's your zoom slider, um, audio slider, and it's very easy to focus and do exposure. This is focus, the circle's exposure, and you can lock them once you're happy with it, and it's very those are your audio monitors, so it's a very easy to use interface for doing web video and much better than your on-phone cameras. Um, for audio, I recommend this app, Voice Recorder Pro. Most of the reason why is because, again, getting things off your phone is tricky, especially with Apple, who for some horrible, sadistic reason wants to make you put all your Apple, all your audio through iTunes. This is how you avoid having to deal with iTunes. Uh, here's, uh, and it's really it's about all the settings you can do. You have an amazing control over settings with this audio recorder app, which I think is free actually. And uh, you can choose, you know, M4As or WAVs or whatever you want. You can limit settings for space. Um, and here's where you can export your export settings. One really good thing about it is it will export your metadata if you want to, which is very important for a lot of what Amy talked about, about getting good information about what you have. So quickly on metadata, there's essentially two kinds. There's the technical metadata, which your phone generates usually for automatically, which is all the technical information about your file, what kind of file it is, how big it is, when it was taken, where it was taken if you have that setting turned on for geolocation. And then there's the other metadata, which is who's in the photos. And that's the stuff that's going to be really important to get uh, whenever you are digitizing stuff, is as much information about the photo in reality that you can get. But both kinds of metadata are going to be important for creating the archive. Um, what's that? Oh yeah, that's more settings. I was really excited about settings when I put the slide presentation together. Now here's the example of just how many ways you can get this thing out of your phone. This is not even the whole page. It goes on, you scroll down for like another 20 or 30. Insane number of ways you can get files out. So anyway, that's the end of the presentation part. Yes? Sorry, Shane, was that a Voice Recorder Pro or oh, Voice yeah. Record Pro? It's called Voice Record Pro. Voice Record Pro. Yeah, Diana Networks Limited. That's the one you want. Again, there's a lot of, whenever an app's really good like this, they always copy it. You want the right one. Diana Networks Limited. Um, so what I do have is I have a bunch of, I have show and tell over there for anyone that's interested. And what I'm, what a lot of that uh, equipment is, is the equipment that we would like to see come into general use and be checked out from our community partners if possible. Um, and it's all just some really helpful stuff. A lot of it's really affordable, so if you just want to get it yourself, and you know, because it'll enhance your ability to do DIY work, uh, we'll do this. So we can talk about. It. So everybody, get up and come over here, and I'll do my best to do a coherent show and talk.